Peter's message, I sensed from reading it, had an urgency and a passion. Peter wants the readers to recall the words of the holy prophets and the words of Jesus. And note this, in the last days, a belief in a literal second coming of Jesus will be replaced by a message of uniformitarianism. That God has judged this planet in the past by a flood. But he said, there's a judgment that's coming in the future. And this time it will be by fire. And that judgment will be for the ungodly. Peter also says that God's timetable is not man's timetable. God is not willing that any should perish. God has provided a way of salvation. You see, one of the reasons why I feel compelled to give these kinds of presentations is to help people to understand that the Bible is true, that what God has said in his word about what has occurred in the past can be trusted and believed. And if you can trust and believe what God has said about what has happened in the past, then you better pay attention to what he is saying about what is going to take place in the future. And if there has been a judgment that has occurred in the past, there should be evidence that it has occurred. And this is where the term was coined, the present is the key to the past. It's called uniformitarianism. No major catastrophic events have ever occurred. Same kinds of things that we see happening in the world today have happened throughout Earth's history. And so... This chart was drawn to try to explain Earth's history by showing the layers. And on the left-hand side of the chart, you will see layer upon layer upon layer. At the bottom of the chart, the layers that are drawn supposedly are the oldest in Earth's history. And as we go up the chart, the layers become more modern. Eventually at the top of the chart, the most recent layers that are deposited. Each layer represents millions of years of time based upon their assumption. Now, this creates a problem. If layers can be formed quickly, what about this assumption that the layers of the geological column took hundreds of millions of years? If that's the case, then our whole concept of time, based on long periods of time to lay down layers, could be wrong. And they <clears throat> determine the age of a layer based on the fossils, that are found in the layer. And they determine the age of the fossils used to date the age of the layer. You see, this is circular reasoning. And it is exactly the way geologists use the column to date fossils and to date layers. And now I will illustrate that for you. Let's say you find a trilobite. And you want to know how old it is. Well, if you took it to a geologist, he could tell you in a matter of minutes. You'd say, oh, well, that's a trilobite. I know how old that is. He would take you to the chart, the geological chart. And he would show you where the trilobite is found on the chart. Now that you found the fossil on the chart, you go to the chart and you determine the age of trilobites based on an age that was assigned, or should we say guessed at, in the 1700s. Have these layers been formed gradually over long periods of time? Have the fossils simply been buried by some process that's occurring today? Or has something occurred in Earth's history that's brought about a destruction of life and layered down the, the layers? Remember the layers? They're all over the planet. How are they formed? Well, there's evidence quickly. Catastrophically. Remember the things that we predicted. A temperate climate from pole to pole. Vigorous growing conditions. The earth protected from radiation. This temperate climate would exist all over the planet. Life would grow larger. And it would live longer. And then the great flood came. A major worldwide event which involved the destruction of life. The fountains of the great deep broke up. The windows of heaven were opened, and it rained for 40 days. So what occurred? Well, I think if we take exactly what the scriptures say, literally, we can understand. Speaking of the planet, we could take a trip 
all over on every continent. And we would find example after example that clearly reveals that in the past something has occurred that has brought about a sudden destruction of life. Like fish in Scotland, their fins extended, their eyes bulging. They've been caught and buried in a moment of time. In Germany, fish buried in oily bituminous, that's oily clay mud, again, quickly caught and preserved. National Geographic typically promotes the evolutionary view of human origins. And here in this mural, we see two different groups of human beings at different layers or levels of the evolutionary development. See, this impression is that as we go back in time, our ancestors were more primitive. Well, here's Mary Leakey, and there you can see taking some measurements of a footprint found in volcanic material. And this is what Richard says, these footprints are the best evidence we have of what our ancestors were like, and we can trace our lineage back to them. Well, notice in the insert, there's a man standing next to one, and his pant leg is rolled up, and his sock is removed, and the National Geographic states, the form of his foot is exactly the same as ours. Now in the English language, the word exactly means exactly. It's the same. So National Geographic invited an artist by the name of Jay Maternus to come to the location. He does a lot of artwork for various museums. And along with the tracker, who had identified the other footprints. And there were many different footprints along with these alleged human footprints. So the tracker identified the footprints and then Maternus did the artwork to reconstruct what it looked like 3.75 million years ago. And here is the painting. In the footprints that looked like guinea fowl, the artist painted guinea fowl. And they look exactly like guinea fowl look today. In the footprints that look like giraffe footprints, the artist painted a giraffe. And it looks identical to a giraffe that you would see today anywhere in any zoo. In the footprints that look like elephant footprints, well, the artist painted a herd of elephants. And they look like elephants. In the rabbit footprint, the artist painted a rabbit, just like a modern rabbit. And off to the side, it's difficult to see, there's an ostrich that was painted because there was ostrich footprints there. But in the footprints that are identical to ours, the same, no difference. The artist painted two adult baboon part human-like creatures without any clothes, one carrying a baby, the other a stick. There it is, in the name of science. You see, the Bible makes it clear that Man has been man from the beginning, Adam and Eve. And that God made man. Man came on the scene suddenly. There's no place in the Bible that I can see that we could permit this concept that over millions of years there was a progression and development from an amoeba to man. God doesn't say, over time, survival of the fittest, dog eat dog, brought about the existence of all forms of life. No, the Bible says, in the beginning God created, and he gives us that account of the various kinds of life that he created, and at the end of the creation week, he created man from the dust. We're told that Adam and Eve were created in God's image. They were creative beings, loving beings, caring beings, I believe humble beings. All of the characteristics and attributes of God, God created man. With a body, with a soul, and a spirit. With a free will. Man was created with a free will so that man could choose whether we would remain in the relationship with the Creator. He didn't create them as robots so they were programmed only to love God. No, they had a choice. They were part of this perfect creation which we've talked about earlier. And because they made a wrong choice, something happened to that perfect creation. There was a fall. God was troubled by the direction that man went. Man followed after the fallen spiritual dimension. 
You see, you can't understand human history unless you understand there's a God who created, and also there's a God who has an adversary who wants to destroy what God has made. Serpent, the dragon, the devil, the one who deceives the whole world. Satan came to the garden and in Encouraged Eve to disobey God. And as a result of the disobedience, it triggered the fall and now the degeneration of man and the wickedness and the perversion of mankind, according to the scriptures, was very apparent. And because of their wickedness, God was grieved and he said, I have to bring a destruction to this. And he warned and then he did. And we've already made reference to that in this series, the great Noahic flood. When the fountains of the deep broke up, the windows of heaven were opened. The worldwide destruction that occurred, and there were only a few survivors, eight humans, and a representative of each kind of life. That great event happened, as we can find the evidence in geology, from the strata, from the fossils. Following the great flood, the people started to multiply. As the Bible says, they all spoke the same language. They lived together. And God had instructed them, move out, repopulate the earth. And they said, no, we're going to join together. And in rebellion, they built a city, Babylon. That isn't what God intended. Secondly, they said, let us build for ourselves a tower that will reach the heavens. And this angered God. And here now at the Tower of Babel, once more, they repeated what they had done at the time before the great flood. Rather than worshiping God who created everything, they began to worship everything that God created. The sun is God. The moon is God. The earth is God. That's what they were doing. And God was angered and it confounded their language and now they had to separate into various language groups. Two views on human origins. Man's view and God's view. Do you know what Paul says that when we reject the evidence that God has created, what will happen? He says the evidence is so clear, it's so obvious that if you reject it, you're without excuse. He goes on to say that our hearts will be darkened and professing to be wise instead will become fools. Believe a lie. There's something else that he states. He says it's predictable that when man tosses God off the scene, rather than worshiping God, he'll worship what God made, the creation. And it can be demonstrated that has happened historically. Every civilization that I've shown you here today, that's what they did. And where are they? All we have is their artifacts. This idea that we've evolved from lower to higher is the Darwinian view. But as we're going to see in our next presentation, the Darwinian view has prepared us for a whole other world perspective that man will continue to evolve onward and upward to become a new and higher being, that we are connected to everyone and everything, and that it is only a matter of time that the next phase of evolution will take place. And in order for that to happen, we can introduce various kinds of methods and therapies. The use of crystals, meditation, yoga, kundalini, which is a kind of yoga. By the way, that's called the serpent power. I would like to take you on campuses where I go. I would like to show you what's being taught, the leading edge of thought today regarding what is science. While creation is being claimed to be religion, Eastern religion is being promoted as science. And the pagan practices of the past are being introduced. It's called the new spirituality. And that's where we're headed. 